And good evening, everybody. Welcome to Embrace Church for our midweek Bible study and time in the Word. Uh, how do you know it's summertime in Texas? I'm wearing short sleeves. <laughs> I'll be honest. I don't think I've ever worn short sleeves at church before. I don't, I don't think so. It, that's crazy. But I figured, you know what? It's hot out. It's a busy day. I'm going to be ripping and running today, as Tony would say. Uh, and so I'm going to be comfortable. So don't mind my short sleeves. It's hot in Texas. And so that's just what we do, right? We adapt. Mm -hmm. So so glad that you all are here with us this evening. Happy Pride Month. Um, we're, we're still celebrating Pride here at Embrace Church. Hey, wait, Church. Pastor. I just got in myself from ripping and running. Oh, I hear that. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> just moving from the car to wherever you're going, you work oh, yeah. up a sweat. Yes, that rip and running is no joke. <laughs> but go ahead, I hate to interrupt. Happy Pride. <laughs> Happy Pride, and we're we're what in our in our fourth week, third week, fourth week. Fourth week yeah. It's our fourth week. I think there's five Thursdays um, during this month, so we got one more one more Thursday to kind of wrap things up uh, on Embrace in our in the series that we're in right now. And so thank you for being a part. Um, just a little brief recap before we get into that, just a few announcements. Don't forget, this Saturday is the Pride Festival here in San Antonio. We will have a presence here at the, at the Pride Festival this year. We're looking forward to it. I think we're just about ready, and uh, we're excited. Come on by the booth. Say hello. Let us know that, uh, um, that you've been with us, uh, whether online or, of course, in person. I'm sure we'll see some familiar faces and it'll be a great time together, uh, looking for uh, opportunity to meet some new people, and so we're excited for that. We're, we're looking forward to it. And if you'd like to help us, if you're a regular member or a tender here, you'd like to help us, pop on in whenever you're free. Lend us a hand. We'll be there for throughout the duration of the festival, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, it should be a great time, of course. We'll have water and Gatorades, and we'll have some snacks as well. Um, and some things to help keep us cool because we know Saturday is going to be hot. hot. Yes, it will be hot, but we will enjoy it, all right? So make it a point to, to come visit us. And, of course, if you're able to come help us, come help us and lend us a hand. We're looking forward to it. Uh, this Sunday, of course, our regular time of worship, 11 o'clock a.m. Uh, it's always a great time to start off the week. Uh, we look forward to it. Make it a point to be there. We will see you there. 11 o'clock a.m. for our regular time of worship. Uh, looking forward to it then. Uh, other announcements. Don't forget, next month, next month, Embrace Church will be celebrating three years uh, as a church. It will be our three-year anniversary. Uh, we're going to be celebrating it on the 17th. Uh, we don't have a slide for it yet or anything, but make, mark it on your calendars now. We want everybody there for our three-year anniversary, all right? Everybody, you, you, you've been online, you've been with us, you've maybe been a little sporadic sometimes. No, everybody will be there on what date? The 17th of July. Mark it on your calendars right now, all right? We're going to have uh, some snacks afterwards. We'll have some special music uh, that we'll be preparing for that. And so we're looking forward to a great time celebrating our three-year anniversary here at Embrace Church. should be wonderful. Uh, what other announcements? Don't forget our regular worship rehearsal, 7 o'clock p.m. every Wednesday. Um, hopefully moving forward, we should be good to keep that. We had a little hiccup yesterday, but that's all right. We're still prepared for Sunday, so we're good. Uh, we, we should be good moving forward, all right? If you sing or play, come lend us a hand every Wednesday, 7 o'clock p.m. right here. And I think that's it for announcements, right? Let's get right into it. Uh, again, thank you all for being here. Uh, this evening, um, for our time in the Word, we have been looking at, uh, in this series, we started off just kind of um, examining the overall concept that God loves us, right? No one can say or do anything to upset the fact that God loves us. And so that is important and foundational. I think the second week we looked at some things that um, helped us to kind of understand that as we read the scriptures, context matters, Co culture matters, the time period it was written matters, the audience matters, all of these little things that sometimes we fail to recognize in our modern day uh, society, um, they weren't 
applicable when we read the scriptures through that lens. And so we have to kind of put ourselves in the mindset of the time period to help us understand the full meaning. And then last week, we started tackling some of the verses that are often used to discredit affirming churches, those who are part of the LGBTQ plus community, uh, those who um, would consider themselves allies. Uh, there are several verses that are in the scripture that they try to use um, to say that it is wrong, that it is sinful, that it is, uh, as the word we looked at last week, it's an abomination. Uh, right? They're not understanding the full meaning of that word. And so we started tackling last week some of the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, if you recall, we looked at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah as found in Genesis chapter 19. We looked at that story. Uh, if you want to get a, a, a more in-depth recap on that, look at last week's video. It'll help catch you up to speed. Uh, in the, after that, we looked at the verses that are found in Leviticus. Those particular verses, Leviticus 18, 22, and Leviticus uh, 20, verse 13, uh, we looked at those, and we looked at the, the, that word abomination and what it means and how it's a cultural thing, all right? Uh, some of the things that, we, that were takeaways from, uh, from last week that I think we'll pick up on this week is this idea, uh, Tony mentioned it in our closing, last week is this idea that Leviticus is not applicable to Christians today, right? We kind of, we kind of understand that. And we see that in several verses in the scriptures. I, I think you'll have this, Jacob, if you can pick it up uh, in the midst of all that mess that we have back there, Romans 10, 4. We just have so many verses throughout our studies. Uh, we're backtracking a little bit. So Romans 10, 4. Just in regards to the law, the scripture says here, uh, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Right? Christ is the end of the law. And that's what Leviticus is. It's the law. It's the law that God gave. It's important, of course, for sure. There are several pictures. Uh, the sacrificial system is introduced uh, in the law and, and all of that pointing towards Christ. Uh, Paul says in another portion of scripture in Romans, if it were not for the law, we would not know sin. In other words, we wouldn't know that we are in need. So the law is important, but Christ is the end of the law. Colossians 2, uh, 13 and 14. I think we have that one too as well. That's why I look so dark. Jacob, can you flip that switch in the back? I was looking at that camera. I'm like, man, I look, I look so tan. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Now y'all can hopefully see me a little bit better where I'm not so dark. I... I'm not so dark. Yeah. <laughs> see that complexion in HD, right? <laughs> All right. Colossians 2, uh, 13 and 14. And ye being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh... Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out, what? The handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. The ordinances, the old law, the things that we had to abide by, out, he took it out of the way. It was a, a stumbling block, nailing it to the cross. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13 in that he saith, a new covenant. He hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away, speaking of the old law. All right, so uh, things that we kind of um, picked up on in there. We looked at this idea of abominations, and we got the understanding that it's a cultural thing, right? What was okay for the Hebrews to do was not okay for the Egyptians to do because culturally it would have been uh, bad for them. And so what was okay for uh, one nation to do it was, was not okay for God's people to do. And we see some of that things. And it wasn't always negative things, right? Some of the prohibitions in Leviticus were called abominations that we don't consider abominations today, right? There were cultural things that they were trying to uh, trying to trying to cover Ezekiel eighteen thirteen we see this 
And this is the idea of abominations. You know, that word is often used as we interpret it today. Uh, it's considered something that we looked at last week. It's, it's dis disgusting. It is completely reprehensible. And that's not the word. That's not the, an accurate translation of the word. Uh, Ezekiel 18, 13, hath given forth upon usury. You know what usury is? Interest. It's, it's what it's, yeah, it's what it's talking about. It's about charging interest. Uh, hath given forth upon usury and hath taken increase. Shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these, what? Abominations. He shall surely die. His blood shall, shall be upon him. There's this cultural uh, thing that they're speaking of in regards to charging interest. Is in charging interest today an abomination? No, it's not, it's not the meaning, that use of the word as we think of it today is not what it's really portraying. Uh, go to the banks and tell, tell them they're an abomination. They're still going to charge you the interest, all right? Uh, they'll, they'll charge you more for their time and everything else. Let's look at... Um, I think hey, Pastor, what did you say usury meant? Usury means charging interest. Like charging interest on a loan. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, we see that we see that uh, in other places in, in scripture that that word usury it comes up in the New Testament as well too. Exodus chapter thirty-five and verse two, we see this uh, this particular you know the, this particular use of the word, but of course we don't consider this wrong today at all. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day thou sh there shall be to you an holy day, a Sabbath of, of rest for the Lord. Whosoever doeth work therein shall be put to death. And that's not how we operate today, right? Well, of course, we have medical professionals and doctors and, and uh, civil servants. Of course, they, their job requires them that they work uh, on those particular days. And we don't consider this uh, worthy of death, right? cultural things that, that, are, that, are being, that are being had here. All right, we'll go ahead and we'll move on. These were the Old Testament uh, verses that we looked at last week in Leviticus. Uh, and the verses um, in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis. We'll move on this evening to the New Testament verses. Uh, if you missed last week or if you'd like to catch up on what we talked about on the Old Testament verses, you can catch uh, that particular session uh, either on our Facebook channel or on our YouTube channel. I think the links for that are in our, uh, in our Facebook post, uh, so, or you can go to our website and, and catch that there too. So if you want to get a little more insight onto what we talked about last week. That'll be there, all right? Genesis, excuse me, New Testament, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is where we're kicking things off after a little brief recap. Good evening to the new member in our, in our meeting room. I said your name there, gave it a well, gave it away. Uh, glad you're with us tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, you're welcome. Good to see you. Romans chapter 1 is where we're looking at this evening. I've said it before, Romans is probably my most favorite New Testament book in its construction, in its uh, intricacy, e even in its plainness and how it's laid out. Uh, it is both rich in context and simple um, uh, in, it, in its layout and how he's building his argument. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church uh, at Rome. And we'll read here. Um, I think I gave you 26 and 27, right? Yeah. Let's back it up a little bit. We'll read a little bit more. Let's start at, at verse 18. And go ahead and put to verse 32. I don't think we'll read all of it, but that's, that's the rest of the chapter. We'll stop where, where it seems fitting. So Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, I'll read for us this evening. The scripture says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, 
who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Uh, understand what is happening here in these first few chapters in Romans. I'm giving you a little bit of context of what's happening. Paul is writing a book, and he's basically laying out the gospel from start to finish. He's laying it all out, and he's addressing all audiences. He's addressing specifically those who were Gentiles, and he's addressing those who were of the Jewish faith. And so in keeping those things in context, right now Paul is arguing that everybody, regardless of your background, is in need of God. So that's what, he's, that's what he's saying here. And we see that in, his, in the words that he's using in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And he continues, but that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. The invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Paul is saying here that as people living in this world, we have some insights on God, right? We have some insights that when we look at the stars, when we look at creation, when you get real minute and you look at the cells in our body and the, the, the processes of life and all of the things that are happening in our world, uh, we can know that there must be a creator. And we can get some insights on, on who he is. And it says here that in doing so, we are without excuse. In verse 21, here's what happens, though, sometimes. Just the nature of people. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who understand what's happening here, right? They, they people in general, like we can understand that there is a God. We can look at all of creation and it, and it testifies of God existing. And instead of honoring God, they've taken the concept of God and perhaps put it in an image. And they're worshiping and glorifying this image instead. And verse 24 here, Wherefore God gave, gave them also up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. And this is where we get into the verses that are a little bit, um, that are the focus of, of tonight's uh, study. Verse 26. For this cause. Hello. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. How you been? Awesome. Wait on the thing. Did you ever get? Did you ever hear? Uh, this? I think you did. All right. So we're reading here. Um, this is where we kind of get into the verses that are a little bit sticky. For God then, for this cause, God gave them up to, to a vile affections, even though women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. All right. Um, and even as they did not like to retain God to their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not 
convenient, all right? We'll stop right there. I think you kind of see the focus of the, of the verses that we're going to be looking at, at least in this chapter in Romans. Um, and we'll go ahead and we'll open in a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word, Lord. I thank you for its truth, Lord. I pray that you'd help us this evening as we examine your word, Lord, that you would help us to have some clarity of mind into what it says, Lord, to have a proper understanding of how to look at your word uh, and to truly grasp the meaning of it. Lord, I thank you for each and every one that is here. Those are with us uh, online. And Lord, I pray that you'd meet with us now. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. So, uh, again, we are uh, in the midst of Pride Month uh, as an affirming church, as a welcoming church uh, that welcomes everybody. We are consider ourselves a Bible-believing church. So we can look at the scripture and we come across passages like this, uh, Romans 8, excuse me, Romans 1, 26 uh, and 27. And what do we do with it? What do we do with this particular passage of scripture? You can put it up there for us, Jacob. Uh, as an affirming church, as a welcoming church, as one who, who truly tries to embrace everybody that, that comes through our doors, How do we tackle this one, keeping all of the things that we've talked about in mind already, understanding the context, the culture, uh, the time period, uh, the audience, um, the, the message of the book, all of these things that we've been talking about. What do we see here? Do you have a mic? Yeah. Okay, just in case. What do you think? Because this is... It, it, it says some things here, right? So how do we, right? The, the, normal, the normal reaction is to, I don't understand it, so we just kind of gloss over it, right? That's what we typically do sometimes. That's what I'm not answering. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's all, it's all contextual. You know, you have to read the entire, you can't just focus on one thing because it's not clear. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, let's, go, let's go back to this question that we asked last week, I think. As an affirming church, what do we affirm? What do we affirm? What is it we advocate for? This should be easy because we asked this last week, right? We advocate for Jesus and that we're all Bible believers and mm -hmm. believing in Jesus. And for people, what are we advocating for? For people. Yeah. He loves everybody. He's not condemning. He's not one to condemn. Um, we're free from condemnation. Uh, yeah. We, he accepts all of us. Uh-huh. You know. He loves everybody. He... Uh, is looking to uh, to express and show his love for us for sure. Uh, we talked about it in in terms of the phrase that that I've quoted before and what Jesus is advocating for us, and that we would have life, right, and have it abundantly. And so we advocate for abundant life for everybody uh, as we are led by the Spirit. That means that if Jesus wants us to have abundant life as he has created us, then that then we can advocate for people to, to be happy and to love who they love and to uh, do the things that we do in this life, to get married, to start families, to, um, you know, to progress well in their professional lives, in the simple acts of recreation, to go out with your partner or with your spouse or uh, whoever it may be and to be comfortable, we can advocate and we can affirm those things, right? That's ultimately what we're trying to do as, as a church, is to live this life as best as we can, led by God's Spirit, living it abundantly, right? And I, and I can speak for myself, and I'm sure many other Christians who are out there, uh, who I love was not a choice, well, you know, that I, that I make, Right? Who I'm attracted to in terms of sex is not a choice that I make. That's who God made me to be. 
And so in that, I should be able to live and love and, and abundantly progress in this life as God leads me. But it's not always that easy, right? There are those who are out there who want to say otherwise. And so as a church, we affirm abundant life for everybody, right? That's what we advocate for. In that context, keeping that in mind, knowing what we affirm, we look at this passage in Romans. What in here do we affirm? Let's start at, uh, let's start at verse 24 of Romans chapter 1. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. I don't know about you, but I'm hoping God's not giving up on me yet, right? We are thankful for God's grace. He is, we talked on Sunday in the instance where we turn to him, he is there. But there are those who rather worship the corruptible, right? Is that us? Is that what we are affirming? No. Are we affirming uh, the lust of our own hearts? No. Oh, look at verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. Is, is that what we're endeavoring to do? No. I, I definitely not what we're endeavoring to do, but I definitely know that that's what um, feels like uh, a lot of times uh, we just create sort of the, our, our closest image and understanding of God. Mm -hmm. And for some people that may be a lie, but I mean, personally, that's why I'm here is to try to get a better a better understanding of God. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that sometimes we do believe, uh, but beliefs are, it's hard to call a belief a lie, but he's being really bold, the author here. Was it Paul? Is that who wrote this? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I'm understanding this correctly, Pastor. Is, is, is he straight up calling some believers of false religions, uh, is he calling their beliefs a lie? When you look at verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. The, the truth of God, the, the, the very existence of God, the, the very nature of God in what, he's in what he described above, right? Uh, the, uh, that God was manifest to us. Uh, verse 20 of Romans chapter 1, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world, clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. That's us. Even his eternal power and Godhead. We are without excuse in regards to the existence and the power and the nature and the majesty of God. The verse that you're pointing out, verse 25, who changed the truth of God. The fact that God even exists, right, into a lie. So it's not so much our, our beliefs about God or perhaps our limited capacity or understanding of God. Hey, we're all at different stages. We're all learning and we're all growing. Uh, we're all coming into different um, we're all being illuminated in different ways into our under, complete understanding of God. And understand, I've said it before, we cannot fully know and comprehend all that God is. But we at least acknowledge that God exists, right? And the, what Paul is, is saying here is, there are, is that there are those who even deny the existence of God. And so what do they do? The ver verses a few up, a few verses up, they make God into an image, verse 23, like to corruptible man and to uh, birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. 
right? Verse 25, as we continue, they changed the truth of God into a lie, and they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. We kind of have maybe an, a, a little bit more of an understanding on what Paul is saying here. Did that clear some things up for you, Miguel? Uh, it cleared some things up and gave me a whole lot more questions. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got? What, 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 what questions? So is he also talking about the political understanding, uh, not just the spiritual understanding of God? Political how so? Like the, like, so let me flip back to this where he says, for this cause God gave them up onto vile affections, for even their women did change their natural use onto that which is against nature. I mean, talking about what is against nature, mm -hmm. um, it sounds like the political control of women's rights a little bit today. The, the, we have to, um, we talked about this a few weeks ago, we're trying to view the scriptures through the lens of today when we can't do that, you know? Uh, we're, we're gonna talk, I see. Yeah, we're going to talk about this. We're trying to get to the really the meat of what Paul is saying here um, in, in understanding what he's saying. But I want us to understand and put this into perspective into what we're seeing in Romans and what we're advocating for as a church. Because right now they're not matching up. We're not affirming anything that is going on here, right? We're not affirming somebody who uh, is estranged from God and who is worshiping idols and who is, uh, and who is just completely devoid of wanting anything to do with God despite what they see, right? Uh, because it says way th up at the top, we are without excuse uh, in, in terms to what we can see in regards to who God is. But the chapter continues, uh, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. Likewise, men also... Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. All right. Uh, get some context. Romans 1 through 3. Paul is arguing that all people, Jewish and Gentile, are in need of salvation. Uh, the chapter continues, the, the book continues, Romans 2. He speaks to his fellow Jews. In Romans 1, Paul is, is referencing Gentiles in need of salvation. Uh, and this phrase, God also gave them over to the lust of their hearts. They became inflamed with lust uh, and engaged in sexual behavior with people of the same sex. Now, understanding the time period that we are in. In the time period that we, that we are in, it was considered <clears throat> Let me read this commentary for you. I think this will explain it a little bit better. This is by John Christostom. He's a commentator on the scriptures. He writes in regards to Romans 1, 26 and 27. And he says here, you see that the whole of desire comes from an excess which cannot contain itself within its proper limits. Paul isn't condemning being gay as opposed to being straight. He is condemning self-seeking excess as opposed to moderation. A concern made clear by his repeated use of the term lustful and his description of people exchanging or abandoning. We kind of understand what's happening. Uh, they are living in such a way that they have, are not only ignoring God, uh, but they are now going above and beyond in excess of what was considered natural for them. Is that what we're advocating for as a church? Is that what we're trying to affirm? No. No. 
this term, um, looking at verse uh, 27, all right? And likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman. That phrase can be a little confusing for us now, right? We can see that and we can think, well, it's right there, the natural use of the woman, right? These are culturally specific terms for this time period. Look at, uh, look, at verse, look at 1 Corinthians. Jacob will have it for us. 1 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. You have it up already? Oh, awesome. You're quick. It says here, doth not even, what? Nature. Same word. Same Greek word. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Do we believe that today? This is culturally specific stuff going on here. There are churches and denominations. Trust me, I know. My mom knows this as well. Think of fourth grade Mrs. Well, you know her name, Mom. I won't call her out. She's sweet. I love her, but... Where I went to school, they take where I went to school, uh, Christian school growing up, they take this verse to heart. And so every person, you had to have a haircut above your, uh, off of your ears and tapered up your collar and it couldn't be excessive in length. Why? Because this is what they believe, but they don't understand this is a context thing, right? This is a culture thing. Uh, most Christians today believe that the terms nature as described in 1 Corinthians 11, describe what was customary in the first century, not a universal rule for Christians about hair length. We see that in the scriptures already. Numbers chapter 6 and verse 5. This speaks specifically of the Nazarite people. All the days of the vow of his separation, there shall no razor come upon his head. Until the days be fulfilled in which he separated himself unto the Lord, he shall be holy and shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. Who do we know that? Samson. Samson. Yeah. This was Samson. He was a Nazarite. He took this vow, uh, and his hair was flowing and luscious. He could have done a, you know, a shampoo commercial and flipped it around and stuff. <laughs> Cultural things in regards to this word nature that is being used. What other questions or things can we clear up regarding this passage? Uh, understand who we are dealing with here in regards to what is happening. What is being condemned here? Is it these, these particular acts that they're doing? Is that what's being condemned or is it what led them to these acts? It's what led them to these acts, to this excess living. It is their abandonment of God. It is their, uh, their self-seeking gratification. It is uh, their focus on self. Uh, it is, as, as was described, their excess that is being condemned here, not necessarily what they are doing, right? Right? Does that help, or does that make it more muddy? What do you guys think? I think it helps me a lot now to, to, to have uh, heard all that because, um, I mean, you just showed two, two what seem like they could be contradicting statements, and it does kind of remind me that there's a lot of places in the Bible where it says to do a whole lot of things. Mm -hmm. Aren't there – was it you who said there's 365 – Two do's in Leviticus and two two hundred and eighty two two don'ts in Leviticus. So, like, I mean, that, that kind of reminds me of that too. Okay. So, it's about the context, like mm -hmm. you're saying. Mm -hmm. There, there. This this particular passage of scripture is rooted in the culture of the time period, uh, and we'll see that a little bit more as we move forward um, in looking at First Corinthians. But in closing out Romans. Uh, we as Christians can agree with Paul 
that any kind of behavior, to include, as described here, sexual behavior, that is motivated by lustful, self-seeking, self-centeredness is wrong, right? We're not affirming that. We're not affirming what is being described here. And so for those who would try to use this passage of Scripture against us, hey, we believe in God. Uh, we believe that he is the creator and the sustainer of all that there is in this world. We seek after him. We worship him. Uh, and, and we do our best. We, we truly, as a church, we, we try our best to live uh, our life lifting others up, not seeking after self. And so what is being described here in this passage, though it involves some same-sex activity, we would condemn this. In, in, what, in what brought it about, right? So, again, what do we affirm? We affirm an abundant life as we are led by God's Spirit, and this isn't it. This is, these are people who are living and acting far removed from God. So, I hope that helps in this particular passage of Scripture. Uh, let's look at and move on to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we see a list of, uh, of prohibitions that are found in, in this particular passage of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Scripture says, this is again Paul writing to the church that was at Corinth, and he's writing, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? It's a question he's saying. Hey, don't you know this? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, there's one of our key words there, all right? It's one of the words we're going to be looking at, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. That phrase right there, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, all comes from one word, all right? One Greek word. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God, uh, and such were some of you, but you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. I think I have a slide in there, Jacob, the words that are in question um, that we're going to pick out from this particular list. These are the words, and they're translated different. I'm curious, Tony, do you have something different in that translation uh, for Ephesians chapter, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9, and yeah, basically verse 9. Yes. What do you have there? Yes, actually I was going to cut I was going to cut in and and, re, and let you hear what I have in the New King James version. Okay. Uh 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9 starts by saying, "Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived." Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, or covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. So you, it, it's a little more... So this one flat out says homosexual. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's right there in your face uh, with that term homosexuals. This is what we, are look, what we are seeing here is the importance of an accurate translation. And really, we don't have that um, in, the, in, in what we see in the New King, New King James Version. Uh, the, the King James Version, where our verses are read from primarily, you can put that verse up there for us, Jacob, uh, the King James Version, where we normally read from, they try to do it a little bit better in accurately translating that. Uh, for those that are, there you go, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and just verse 9. Uh, they try to uh, capture what is in there. Um, and they use this word effeminate and then this long phrase, abusers of themselves with mankind. Um, they try to use that. Did I put that uh, words to... Now that we're looking at, I'm trying to see how much I gave you guys. 
So this word as translated effeminate in the King James Version, translated, I think, homosexual in the New King James Version, and I think a lot of other modern versions, uh, that's what it's translated as, comes from the Greek word malakoi. That's the Greek word. And it, the, the, the word itself means soft. It just literally, it just means soft. We see other uses of this word, Matthew chapter 11 and verse 8. Jesus is speaking, but what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. That's the same word. Uh, Luke 7, 25, but what ye went out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment. That's that same word, malakoi. It means soft. It's used elsewhere in the scripture. Uh, and it means soft. The other word that is in question here, you can put that back up there for us uh, so we can kind of see the spelling of it and everything, is this word, arsenikoitai. That's the Greek pr pronunciation, arsenikoitai. In the King James, it's translated abusers of themselves with mankind, as, as Tony showed us in the New King James Version. It's uh, described as, uh, translated as sodomites. The fact of the matter is, <clears throat> the reason we don't see these modern uh, interpretations in the King James Version is because there was no single word in the English language in 1611, when the King James Version was written to describe or, or, you know, a word that referred to homosexuals or homosexuality. So we have that awkward phrase. I think in uh, the NASB, it's homosexuals, and the NEB, homosexual perversion, homosexual offenders, and the NIV. Uh, in doing this, they've changed the whole scope of the verse. Right? Put the King James Version verse back up there. Uh huh. Know ye not that the righteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. They changed the whole tone of this verse in using the word uh, homosexuals because the original Greek refers to men only. And now in their translation, in using this word homosexual, they have broadened that scope uh, to incorporate others outside of those of the male gender. They've completely broadened it when that's not what the intention of the original word was. We know that. Why? Because that Greek word is a male word. And so we have kind of a mistranslation here. This word, arsikina, let me look at it again, arsenek, I could say it in my head, arsenokoitai, arsenokoitai, okay? This particular word, Paul kind of made it up. We, this is not a common Greek word. We don't see this hardly anywhere. I think maybe one other place outside of Scripture that we see it. Paul made this word up, uh, trying to describe what he was trying to describe. The truth of the matter is, we don't know exactly what it means, but we know it does not mean homosexuals and it doesn't mean sodomites. Why? Because there are Greek words that are in existence that describe those, and this isn't it. This isn't it. Most likely, uh, what we are seeing here, and we get a key in the King James Version, all right? Remember, keep in mind, what do we affirm as a church? All right, look at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Let me just turn to it because I'm, I'm way on my, off my page. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Even if you don't know the Greek, even if you don't know all of the, the stuff that I just mentioned to you, when you look at it, know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay, is that, is that referencing us right now. Do we, 
we, we, we talked about this on Sunday. Uh, God looks at us for all who believe, and he sees what? The righteousness of Jesus, right? That's not us. We're not, we're not living crazy. We believe that, that, that you know, we are, are, are covered and redeemed. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not, shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers. Are we advocating for abuse here? No. Not at all. That's not what we're advocating for. More than likely, what these verses are, what these words and what these verses are, are, refer, are referencing are the effeminate, the soft in the day, who were being abused and taken advantage of by those who were older than them. We have these soft and we have these ones who are above them who are abusing them. This is uh, pedophilia. This is stuff going on in the temples during that particular day where there's imbalances in power uh, in what is going on here. Uh, this is more than likely what is being referenced in this verse. And we're not advocating for that. We're not affirming that. That has nothing to do with us as Christians living the abundant life. Right? As we are led by the Spirit, the Spirit is not going to lead us to do this. And so are these verses applicable for us? Uh, are they against us? No. Is there same-sex behavior being described here? More than likely because it's, again, referencing males. But what is being described is not what we are advocating for. Not what we are advocating for. What are your thoughts on that? Questions, comments? It's all about the translation. This is why translation. Sometimes it's about yeah. context, and, and oftentimes, sometimes it's context, and sometimes it's translation, and sometimes it's both. But yeah. It's impressive how, in just a little tiny bit of time, um, this it can be thrown off so much. The understanding um, wasn't King James written in what 1600s? I don't know when the yeah. new King James version was written, but 1611. Um, that's kind of sorry. The King James was 1611. And the new King James? I would say it was a lot later than that, yeah. Interesting that the new King James has that word that Tony was reading, homosexual, but the old King James did, didn't. It's, it's, um, it's empowering to hear these things. What is, what is really crazy, in, in that use of the word homosexual, in that wrong translation, it has empowered a whole group of people to condemn. And it has put Christians, uh, well, it has put people in general who are perhaps seeking lose their faith because of a wrong translation. Uh, how many, how many, how many, I would venture to say that the, when you look at the regular population of people, there's probably a higher percentage that are Christian than when you look at the LGBTQ plus community and see how many of those are Christian, I'm sure there's a huge disparity there. Why? Because of mistranslations like this. Uh, it's empowering for those who want to condemn, and it is uh, depowering for those who, you know, who may be seeking but feel like they can't because of a wrong translation. It's important to know this stuff. I, I know that w in my preparation, I don't have the statistic here, but the term homosexual, it's a modern term. And we only see it in the modern translations. We don't see it in translations prior uh, to, the, to, to the widespread use of the term. That's why the King James is so, so weird about how they translate it. But it's for sure referencing, uh, as it's described here, things that are wrong. This is Harper's Bible commentary. 
uh, and it states that the passage refers to both the effeminate, this is where that soft comes in, right? Both the effeminate male prostitute and his partner who hire him. These are the two people that are being described in this passage of scripture, and that for sure is not something that we are advocating for. We're not advocating for the uh, for for what is being described um, in here. Important to know context, and important to know culture, important to know all of these things, um, and not just take it at you know what we can read on the page. Sometimes you got to dig a little deeper. All right. Uh, other comments, other questions on anything that we see here? We've looked at the passages in Romans. Uh, we've looked at the passages uh, here in 1 Corinthians. Uh, the same would be applicable to what we've looked at in uh, 1 Timothy. We didn't look at it. Yes, Pastor, I'd like to... Um... Go ahead, Tony. Oh, okay. Um in the New King James Version, mm -hmm. at that First Corinthians uh, chapter six, that verse nine, mm -hmm. uh, next to the the end of the verse, they have a little reference. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, excuse me. They have a they have a re reference uh, scripture, and it's telling me to go to Galatians five twenty one, mm -hmm. and uh, it has male homosexuals next to it. So I went to five. Uh, Galatians 5.21, but I'm going to start reading at the 18th verse. Okay. And it says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the work, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and heresies. Mm -hmm. Verse 21 says, envy, murderers, drunkenness, revilers, or revelries, mm -hmm. and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that whole translation thing, like you said, even though it referenced me to go to Galatians 21 and it says male homosexuals, it still kind of put it in a lump mm -hmm. uh, of, of all this stuff, envy, murders, drunkenness, uh, revelries, mm -hmm. and the like of which. Yeah. The, Paul, Paul does this, uh, I won't, won't say a lot, but he, he does a lot of lists like this. There's a few other lists like this. Uh, the other list that, um, mm -hmm. that is often referenced um, is in 1 Timothy. Uh, there's another list there in regards to scriptures that are used, um, used against us. But it's, it's the same. It's the same sense of the word, the same use of the word and what it's describing um, power imbalances, prostitution, pederastry, some of those things that, of course, we are for sure, uh, for sure against as Christians. It, it's just not applicable to us. Uh, and when we understand the, the translation problems surrounding some of these verses and get some insight into the cultural practices of the time period, uh, things can become a little bit clearer for us. So... Any other questions or comments or anything else you all want to add on this? Any clarifications? Well, Joseph, I would, I've been listening to the, the, uh, the study tonight. This is Douglas and mm -hmm. uh, very, very intrigued. And um, you guys may know, but I came from a very strict background of oneness Pentecostals that a lot of the focus on the no-nos was a lot of the women's hairdos and jewelry yeah. and things like that. And I just wonder, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I wonder about Jesus advocating, you know, the fact of same sex, if he really felt like that's not a big deal, because thinking of the disciples, 
the brotherly love. There might have been something going on that maybe is not a recorded in the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't matter. But the, the love that was there, mm -hmm. not a not a not a sensual, you know, thing that's mm -hmm. this derogatory or, or, or yeah. you know, nasty or whatever. But something that's love between two men is not wrong. Yeah. And I think Jesus himself, if he was here today facing us, he would say, there's no there's no problem with that. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody's making a big deal out of it. And it's really not that big of a deal. And I, yeah. I'm just speaking my mind. But I just wonder, you know, sometimes I brought that up. And I, I will just say the UPC is where I came from. Uh -huh. And and just thought, you know, and I would mention it to, to brothers and sisters. What about the disciples being hand in hand? Mm -hmm. What about the disciples spending so much time together and they would avoid my conversation? <laughs> and I'm not trying to be contradictory, but I'm yeah. just speaking my mind yeah. and just wonder what your thoughts would be on that with the disciples and Jesus. I mean, it's hard to tell there, but I, I will I will say this in, in regards to this attitude that, you know, we can, and here's the focus, love who we want to love, who, who we feel we are attracted to. We can love whoever we love, right? But love is, love is different than lust. Exactly. Love a big is, amen to that. Love, exactly. love is different than wanting to take advantage of. Love is different than self-seeking, self-gratification. Uh, I've had conversations, you know, Jacob and I obviously were married. We, we talked and stuff like that. One of the first conversations that I remember having with him is that, uh, in, in any relationship, uh, our, my focus should be to make you happy. Your focus should be to make me happy. And if we're both on that same page, on, the, on that same wavelength, then we're going to be good, right? But, and that's love. And there's no, there's, there's no qualms. There's no, um, as the scripture says, there's no law against love, right? There's no law against love. Uh, against such, there is no law, I think is how the scripture quotes it. Um, but we do see some constraints on what is being described here in the passage yes. that we looked at tonight. The self yeah. Joseph, the self I mentioned also, you know, yeah. the people would would condemn me and I would tell them, you know, when I came out, I, I left a wife. I was in a heterosexual marriage mm -hmm. and everything came mm -hmm. out about me and, and I went to the altar to their, their, their uh, lamenting. And I prayed and cried hard, God, yeah. if this is wrong, take it away from me. If yeah. it's wrong, yeah. heal me. And he never did because this is the way he made me. Mm -hmm. And amen, I'm happy to be who I am because God made me this way and I'm yeah. rejoicing today. Yeah, This is a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think when we've come to a full understanding of what the scripture is actually saying and what it's actually teaching, and understand that what it, it what it says it is against, we're also against, right? The abuse, the self gratification, the self lust, all of those things, we're opposed to those. Well, we're not opposed to loving relationships, to lifting each other up, to living uh, as abundantly we as we can, as we are led by God's Spirit. Against all of that, we see no prohibitions in the Scriptures whatsoever all right we have one more week next week um we've looked at at, at all of the scriptures that kind of uh, deal with this topic it's amazing for such a big issue that people make out of it there's really not that much that the scripture says about it right uh, but it does uh, give some prohibitions for the practices of the day what we're going to do next week uh, hopefully we have one more week one more thursday this pride month how do we deal with those who who may argue the other side, right? How do we, how do we, I don't want to say combat, but how do we defend our faith? How do we defend what we, what we believe and what we hold to um, in perhaps having encounters with those who uh, may believe differently? We don't want to be argumentative, but we can be informative, right? We can be helpful. Um, and in helping somebody else see the clarity uh, of what's being presented, Hopefully, we can change a few minds, and in doing so, uh, we can impact uh, some lives down the road, all right? So it's, that's hopefully the goal next week as we conclude our Pride Series um, this year, all right? Uh, it's 10 after. Just real briefly, any final thoughts, any final questions before we end tonight?
All right. If you've been with us on Facebook or on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will conclude this evening. Uh, those that are here and those in, that are in our virtual meeting room, we will continue on with our time of, uh, of prayer. I hope that you'll stick around for that. Otherwise, we will see you Sunday for our time of worship, 11 a.m. We'll see you at the Pride Festival Saturday as well.